hype machine. Don't believe the hype machine. We provide survival news for dogs. Don't believe the hype machine. Death for the journalist. To help you overcome any fear of the future. Don't believe the, don't believe the, don't believe the, don't believe the. It's Friday, April 18th, 1930. Hello everyone and welcome to Barncat Media. This is a show where I talk about books, films, and events of the past and present through the lens of cultural and media theory. Uh, today's episode is the second of a two-parter in which I talk about nationalism and the role that media has played in shaping our national consciousness. So in the recent episode I talked about how the arrival of print media in the 15th century uh, was a major factor in how we were able to start thinking of ourselves as belonging to a nation. In this episode, I'm going to talk more about Benedict Anderson's book, Imagined Communities, uh, specifically how books and newspapers paved the way for national consciousness in the way that they got us thinking differently about space and time. And then finally, I'm going to jump into the 21st century and talk about social media and how social media continues on this trend described by Anderson of uh, media providing a sense of virtual cohesion amongst a group of people. So I mentioned in the last episode that the ability to mass produce books and newspapers helped pave the way for national consciousness in the way that it uh, developed the public sphere. And so inherent in the idea of a public sphere is of course the idea of a public. And whereas a crowd refers to a group of people who are linked together by the physical space they occupy, the public refers to a group of people who are linked together virtually by the same media they consume. And so if you recall Anderson's definition of a nation, he defines it as an imagined political community. And he argues that the way books and newspapers depicted space and time uh, provided us the technical means for reflecting back to us the kind of community that we call nations. And so how exactly did books and newspapers uh, reflect space and time in a way that allowed us to imagine the communities that we live in? Well, we can begin first off with books. And so Anderson uh, begins talking about this literary trend that began to develop around the 18th century in several different countries, different cultures. And what characterized this trend was how time was being presented differently. And one example of this was uh, different events within a society occurring simultaneously. And in film, this is sometimes called parallel editing, in which in one scene, uh, we see what's happening with one character, and then in the following scene, our perspective switches to what's happening to another character at that same time. And so the viewer or the reader is provided with this omniscient vantage point in which we have more knowledge over the story world than any single character in that story does. So this literary technique that began developing calls attention to two things. The first thing is that these different events are occurring simultaneously. The second thing is that even though these different characters uh, may never cross paths or enter into each other's storylines, they are all happening within the same society or the same sociological entity. And Sir Anderson draws this analogy between how a reader is able to imagine these different events occurring within the fictional world of their book with how a member of the actual public is able to imagine different events occurring within their society. So the omniscient vantage point of the person who learns about their nation through books, television, and other media is predicated upon this omniscient vantage point of the reader who is given access to all the different events occurring simultaneously within the fictional society of their book. And so if books served as a prototype for how to imagine the communities we call nations, so too did newspapers, as well as providing the material for what to imagine about our nations. So you can think of a newspaper as like a one-day bestseller in which on the day of its release, everybody is reading it, and then on the next day, it instantly becomes obsolete. And the significance that this has on our sense of time is that the reading of a newspaper becomes a kind of mass ceremony by which everybody is reading roughly the same stories at roughly the same time. And although this ceremony is performed within the privacy of the reader's mind, it becomes something that is manifested externally in the way that newspaper stories, and today you could even say uh, TV shows, films, celebrity tweets, they all set the conversations for the day. Morning paper, council buys park, Scouts find lost girl. And uh, media historian Paul Starr describes this by saying that once a newspaper circulates, no one ever truly reads alone. 
Readers know that others are seeing it at roughly the same time, and they read it differently as a result. Conscious that the information is now out in the open, spread before a public that may talk about the news and act on it. And so this virtual linkage of members of the public through media is turned into something that's observable, as media delivers us the common ideas and images of the day. And the last thing I'm going to say about newspapers is the way their structure imitates the way we imagine the nation. So Anderson talks about the arbitrariness in which newspaper stories are thrown together in the same edition. Uh, so for example, on the front page story of a newspaper, I might read a story about the president's inaugural address. And then uh, in that same paper in the sports section, I might read a story about the Seahawks game. And so the only things that these two stories have in common with each other are the two things that the different events in a book described earlier have in common with each other. And that is that one, they are both situated within or relevant to a society, and two, they share a temporal coincidence of having occurred at or near the same time. And so just to recap what Anderson has said about books, newspapers, and media in general, is that they reflect time and space in a way that mirrors the way we imagine the nation. I, for example, have never seen tropical storms in Florida or protests in Wisconsin, but by reading the New York Times or listening to NPR, I'm participating in the public sphere by consuming the same media as my fellow countrymen, and I'm therefore able to imagine these events are happening. And again, this is because books and newspapers have trained us to perceive the events in our society uh, through this omniscient vantage point by which we have knowledge of the events in our community, whether we're there to observe them firsthand or not. And so if books and newspapers gave us the prototype for how to imagine the communities we call nations, social media in the 21st century has really taken the next step in providing a sense of assemblage amongst a group of people who, if you recall in reality, are only linked together virtually. Social media has provided us the means through which we can know where someone is and at a specific time. And it does this with such things as Facebook Timeline, which chronologically documents every activity you ever made on Facebook. So just by glancing at it, I can connect a certain activity of yours with a specific time. And furthermore, with the combination of GPS devices like cell phones and GPS software like uh, Foursquare or Google Latitude, I can be notified of somebody's exact location at a precise time. And so social media, combined with the mobile devices, plugs us into a virtual network through which fairly detailed information pertaining to time and space can be shared. And just as newspapers gave us these disconnected snapshots of events transpiring within our society, which are really only linked by the temporal coincidence they share of having occurred at the same time, um, media in the 21st century, such as news feeds and the 24-hour news network, really takes us to the next level by providing us those same snapshots of events uh, transpiring simultaneously within our society, but on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. And so with media of the 21st century, we increasingly become that omniscient reader that Anderson described, in which our national communities, or more recently our global communities, are the stories that we are reading. And because of the growing reach of media, we gain an increasing knowledge of the characters and events involved in the story, whether they be celebrities, friends, or entire countries. And so to sum things up, media over the last several centuries, beginning with the printing press, has enabled human beings to imagine themselves as being a part of a community called a nation. And this extension of knowledge over the imagined communities we live in is what has been largely, although not solely, responsible for the perceived cohesion that exists within members of a nation. And that's it for my thoughts on media and nationalism. Um, all episodes of Barncat Media can be seen on YouTube, and I will see you in the next episode.